circular problem. A lot of career counselors at the universities recommend rural positions because then you can gain experience and then you can come back into the cities and you can get employment based on the experience that you got. And so then we have rural centers that put time and dedication and effort into training positions and getting them ready for actually working in the workforce and then after a year or so they go back to the cities. Another effect that we see with the rural caseloads that are very heavy is that they force clinicians to practice as rural generalists. They have to see many, many people with many conditions, and so they have to be a jack of all trades. They have to wear all of the hats. This doesn't mean they can't be specialized, and some of them are. It just means that on top of their specialty, they still need to have generalized practice. In urban centers, because of the multiple points of entry of access to care, that allows people to become specialized and work exclusively in those areas. Just perfect. And then clients have to travel to urban centers for services. They get on with these very specialized <coughs> clinicians who are fantastic. But then those urban clinicians are unable to trust 
the in-home rural physicians don't have that specialty because they haven't been able to put the hours towards that specialty as they have in the urban center. So that there's a, I can't trust to discharge them to home community because I don't feel the competence is there. So then you have clinicians who then don't even get the opportunity to work on their specialty because of that trust imbalance. And if we take this a step further, so I'm from Kona, it's a town of 600 people. There is not, the next largest urban center is Regina, which is two hours away. And I am free to live there as long as I am healthy and independent. The second that I lose either of those factors, it becomes very complicated to stay in that rural community. The long-term care beds in those sorts of areas that would be a more advanced care or respite beds, uh, they're usually taken and they're very full. And so even for the elderly in the community, if they need a long-term care bed, they usually get shipped out. I think the policy the last time I checked was within 100 kilometers of their home location. So those are some of the implications. So I kind of want to tell you a little bit more about my lens that I'm looking at the world through, and I kind of already hinted to that already. So I finished my master's degree in 2012 in occupational therapy, and graduated to, and moved to Saskatchewan for one of those careers that I did, and fell in love with the communities in the South. So that position, of course, was empty for a long time. I had a really large demand, and even before I went into grad school, I knew I wanted to go into private practice. And so after a year or so, I started working gradually towards that dream, branching out into different areas and working into private care. And another reason I chose private care was so that I could control the demands that I was under. When you're in a public position, there's just the tidal wave and you need to do the best that you can do and avoid burnout. And then in private care, I found a lot more control over how much and where and when I worked. This doesn't mean that I am against the public health system. Free public health care is one of the only options in Canada. And it's a system that we want to support and that we don't want to collapse or have it overburdened. If you have never been a patient or provider in the system, you might not realize how not free the system actually is. There's a lot of extras, there's a lot of travel, there's a lot of supplies and things that are built out because the system is trying to find ways to compensate for the demand. More funding to the public system may not be realistic due to possible damages being done to other public systems like infrastructure, education, etc. So some things that we can do is the process that are already in place that I actually used when I came here is that a lot of these systems have funding for their youth and companies, private companies, public companies that will fund their youth to get educated with contracts that they have to come back for a certain amount of time with the money that they send. And so that tries to offset that attachment that people develop to the urban centers and it helps them to come back. So that's the one way. And then for a person who has no ties to a rural area like myself, there was moving grants and moving bursaries that helped to draw that were signing contracts to stay. And there are also, every province has a different level of funding for this, but the graduate retention programs to draw into Saskatchewan. And another part that really drew me to the rural health provider health region, like we're all one now in Saskatchewan, but at the time we were all 13 different clubs. The Every single health region had its own education budget that was different, and so our rural region had a much higher education budget for continuing competency than some of the larger urban centers did. So these are some of the things that have already been tried, already in play, and are effective at drawing new grads and having them come into rural areas. Another thing that we can do and we have seen to a certain extent, especially in the rural areas where the demand is so high, is that offloading anybody with benefits into the private sector rather than offloading. And so with workers' compensation, the automobile, Saskatchewan general insurance, um, 
really good work benefits and other large funding sources like Jordan's and Google and things like that. So we have, I have seen from clinicians that work in urban centers across Canada where their clinics will take in these benefits funded clients and they're able to manage it because there are many access points in the urban center. Whereas in rural centers, they offload these to the private sector because the demand is too high. So it would be important to utilize that kind of funding to offload the public system. Um, another thing that is really unique about private care is we all know that large institutions, it's very difficult for them to shift and pivot based on changing needs. It takes a long time to justify that a physician has to be moved to an area with such a need uh, that programs have to be adjusted. Whereas in private care, the, if the work dries up, that private needs to shift the practice and fill a different gap. They have to fill a different need. And this happens very quickly because they have to make a living, right? And so as they make a living, as their workload changes, as their caseload changes, they have to change and shift and do something different. Back to those long-term care centers. Um, health providers don't have to be the only ones in private care that are making a difference. It's also the elite type of health centers. I've seen lots of entrepreneurs who are starting their own long term care centers by the facilities in small communities that have none. And so there are private facilities in urban centers as well as the public, right? Because there's lots of people, lots of demand. And sometimes there are small communities, like some in the south, where there is no public option. And so then somebody in the community starts up a private long term care center uh, that depending on how many nurses they can get, they have need of uh, care they need. And also, I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs that think of really unique ways to run clinics with really low costs and really allow their clinics to work for them with a lot of freedom and movement. Um, and then they find more profitable ways, different pricing structures to provide help. So what I have been up to, So over the last five years that I've been working in private practice and I gradually went into that, I was finding that I was having a hard time getting my paperwork done. And paperwork is extremely important in healthcare. Those records are critical. And I know if any of you are associated with healthcare, you're doing paperwork for like hours and hours and hours. So I was finding that because of the rural travel time, I wasn't able to get as much of my paperwork done, that my caseload with the paperwork and the travel was surpassing more than your typical eight hour work day. So I started developing a charting system, which is the electronic health information system charting application. Um, this is an electronic secured platform located in Canada, and it allows any access from any data point to chart, to record, film, uh, any sort of pictures, any of that kind of stuff. The greatest feature that I love about it is that you can do voice dictation and there is medical transcription built right into the program where I can securely transfer audio files to a transcriptionist who then interprets and I'm not worried about that. Whereas previously for an allied health profession, dictation was something we only saw in highly funded urban centers and it was just not an option for any sort of a definition. Um, and so that was a big part that we built into the system was that it allowed to use and leverage that travel time to also get the paperwork done after just sitting at a desk and being like, I'm not a desk person. So today, um, so today, what I found as well as I started doing this and living this life, a lot of my peers approached me, a lot of people started emailing me from across Canada asking, how do I do this? Where do I start? Um, what are the legislation differences in Canada versus the States? Uh, there's lots of really confusing things. Uh, for example, HIPAA. So in Saskatchewan, we have HIPAA, which is our Health Privacy Act. And in the States, they are federally governed by HIPAA. H-I-P-P-A, and that creates a big part of confusion for people who live in Saskatchewan because they feel like all of the things that they Google 
applies to them. And so I've been working over the years to separate Canadian from American legislation. I've been developing courses for private practitioners on how to start a private practice, how to become privacy officers, how to be secure, how to be compliant with Canadian legislation and all that sort of things. Uh, we plan on continuing to develop the software to include things like billing, invoicing, video conferencing, and more. Um, for resources, we have we make a lot of legal documents for people to just take and download for their private practice and use, put their own branding on, that sort of thing. Um, I think my role is starting to shift into supporting these private practitioners rather than working as a clinician as much as I was in the past, I find a lot of uh, it's very motivated to work with these people who are making a huge difference. And I kind of want to take a quick a little bit to tell you about these people. So we have a rural practitioner who is making a huge difference. She built a sensory clinic inside an old school bus and plans to drive around rural communities providing care. We, we have other people who are doing uh, video conferencing like psychology counseling services to large and very rural areas in Saskatchewan. Uh, what else was there? We've got lots of those entrepreneurs who are practicing as well as having uh, specialized pediatric daycares for children with special needs and they rent all of their extra rooms to other allied health professionals. So the daycare that has allied health support. So we're talking speech therapists, PTs, it's very impressive, and we have lots of people across Canada who find that going digital is a lot easier. They don't have to pull around their paperwork. They don't have to get space to store the paperwork. Uh, they're not using extra rooms in their houses. It helps transition from that uh, sole practitioner that's just doing work inside to a larger full-time private practice because that gradual change is usually where most people find the biggest problems. There's the, the leap into entrepreneurship that most people are intimidated by. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is Carol Berger. She's from Parkland. Yeah, her colleague sitting here, here and around. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much. I'm really excited to be part of the conference this year um, and hearing about all these wonderful entrepreneurial ideas and things going on out there in the rural area. And of course, what I think is a registered professional planner is do they have their permits? And so I'm taking a little bit of a different tactic here and sharing with you uh, what we're doing in Parkland County with regards to land use planning tools and how we are trying to help people and foster shared economic prosperity. I'll describe Parkland County in a few minutes. So very simply, economic prosperity starts with ideas. In municipalities, economic development officers are enthusiastic and encouraging and supportive of people taking their ideas forward to developing their businesses. And the more a municipality sees that happen, the more prosperous it is, and there are more businesses, there are more jobs, more tax revenue, and greater economic diversification and resulting prosperity for all. However, in order to move these ideas forward to business development, a lot of times people have to go through planning and development to comply with all the plans and regulations and get the necessary permits. Planning and development, it's sometimes seen as a bad word. It seems like a department that sets up a series of insurmountable hurdles, and the result is that these great ideas can end up going nowhere, and new businesses never make it to the finish line. Now, economic development folks and planning and development folks are both doing their jobs, but what is needed is a better understanding by staff in both departments about how to work together to work with people with their great ideas and help them navigate the hurdles of planning and development to go through this seed. This is this important connection 
is being taken very seriously by both of us in Parkland County. First of all, planning and development is about the rules. And I'm not saying we break the rules to get our businesses going, but we can't take away those hurdles because legislative requirements are well required. Rather, how do we work within those rules, using the tools we have available to help people seamlessly navigate those hurdles? Parkland County is a large rural county with nearly 2,400 square kilometers and 32,000 residents. We have about 11,500 employees and 3,500 businesses. We are located just to the west of the city of Edmonton. In Alberta, talking to people, a rural county is a municipality on the same par as any urban municipality. We have a mayor, a council, administration. Um, within our county boundary, we have two cities, two villages, two First Nations reserves, and five summer villages, all of which are separate entities. We do not have authority over them. It's mostly the rural areas and the small unincorporated towns. So agriculture dominates our landscape. The very rural western half of the county has the hamlets, most all the farmland. Our industrial park right next to Edmonton has urban services, even transit. Our variety of recreational amenities result in a lot of seasonal activity that's different from our current country residential areas. And the environmental systems throughout the county are significant. In Alberta, our land use planning framework is similar to that across Canada, but each province has its own terminology. So to give you a quick overview of our framework, Provinces Municipal Government Act leads the charge. We're also part of the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Board. There's about 13 rural and urban municipalities that are part of that, and we're subject to the direction of their regional plan. Each municipality must have a municipal development plan, or an MDP, or comprehensive plan, and we must have intermunicipal development plans with our adjacent neighbors to look at how we're planning along our borders. From there, we have more detailed planning through our area structure plans and our development regulations come through the land use bylaw. All of these then inform our decision making on subdivisions and development permits. Any kind of development coming through, we need to do more. So today I'd like to share how we're helping people to navigate the planning and development hurdles to succeed and in turn enhance economic growth. Hurdle number one, the plans. One plan does not fit all. We are a large diverse county, and so it is challenging to create broad policy plans that recognize the different land use implications in different parts of the county. Great ideas can be hindered by plans and associated policies or encouraged by them. Amendments can be made to plans and new plans created, but this is the most time consuming and costly process that people would need to go through. It's often the process that is least understood by people and business owners, and the plans themselves can be tough to understand, even by experts sometimes. So all, all of this results in challenges and cost and time, and there's always a chance that any of those changes in the plans may not be approved by council. So I, the most important tool to help us get over this hurdle is our municipal development plan. It was approved in 2017 and recognizes the variety of landscapes and built environments across the county. And we have tried to provide policy direction to focus the priorities in the appropriate areas. It's critical to get the broad policies of the MDP correct, as this direction determines how we develop guidelines and regulations for subdivision and development. Our technical growth study, which a little plug here, but we just want to provincial planning awards for that last week, uh, identified 17 different development areas that formed the basis of our future land use map in the municipal development plan. We looked at population, land use, employment, and potential growth and development in each of those areas. From there, we created a future land use map for the county. It's a key element required in every MDP. The agricultural lands are seen in kind of a tan color, yellow, is country residential. There's a dark blob to the right, and that is our industrial park. It also identifies through some of the stars our growth hamlets, as well as some other future potential industrial areas. But what we did here is we actually, normally in an MDP, we have like 
that original map. But what we've done, we've created three overlays to start to get more specific and give us greater policy direction in some key areas. So the first overlay identifies our prime agricultural areas. Out west, the soils are more suitable for larger farms focused on grazing and pasture for soil quality is not as high. To the southeast, you'll find our higher quality soils and a predominance of crop farming. A third area, which is a little purple patched area there in the middle, uh, that has more small holdings where people have smaller farms like berry farms or vegetable farms serve a lot of the urban centers around there. So we have included general <coughs> agricultural policies in our plan, but then for each of these areas, we include more specific ones that were more suitable to the types of agriculture we're trying to encourage in those areas. So for instance, it's preferable to limit the fragmentation and subdivision of agricultural land out in the west, where you have the larger farms, but in the small holdings area, we need to look at sort of mid-sized farms that are more suitable for that type of agriculture. We've also identified three prime recreation and tourism areas. The intent is to focus recreation and tourism activities in this area to build on existing development and natural features and ensure greater collective success. This ensures we can prioritize and maximize investment in those areas. Through the growing number of recreational resorts and tourism related developments that are starting to impact our agriculture and environment areas. And we want to ensure that we have balance amongst all of these uses. Finally, we have many environmental components across the county. We mapped a variety of environmental features, including wetlands, environmentally significant areas, wildlife corridors, soils, and we overlaid all of those maps and looked to see where they intersected the most. Those were the areas where we felt we could probably get the biggest bang for the buck in terms of encouraging preservation and conservation while balancing the right to develop land. With these priority landscapes, we can strengthen policies and regulations in these selected areas to ensure greater cumulative impact. So with these higher level policies in the MDP, we're clarifying a critical first step by recognizing the different land use needs across the county. Feedback from planning consultants and developers is an appreciation for the clarity in this plan, giving them confidence that they can move forward with these potential hurdles. Oh, sorry. Uh, the second tool we're working on is how to make our plans more accessible. Traditionally, creating a lot of these plans can easily take 6 to 12 months or more. They can be very costly and are generally in the form of a very long report. Recently, our Municipal Government Act was changed considerably and it required that we do intermunicipal development plans with every one of our neighbours. So we now have two years in which to complete 10 of these plans. The intermunicipal development plans are fairly straightforward, and so we decided to try a pilot project for them. So here is a sample of our recently approved statutory intermunicipal development plan. It's simply a poster that can be folded up. What's even neater, it comes in pocket size. You keep them right in your pocket, you have all your maps and policies right there where you need them. Of course, the planners think that's cool. <laughs> So we were hoping to complete three of those plans this year. Taking this approach, we have actually, we will have four approved by council by the end of the year and a fifth ready to be approved early next year. And we've probably done it about 25% less of the anticipated budget. So it's been a successful pilot project to look at doing it this way. And we plan to look at this approach and template as we start to update other existing plans in the county that are probably going to be more complex. But the idea of making the plans more accessible and understandable is critical to helping people navigate through this hurdle of aligning with the higher plans and streamlining the process if we do need to make changes. The second set of hurdle, hurdles is the regulations for development. And these are mostly found in our land use bylaw, the book of rules, really. More often than not, any land use bylaw is behind in responding to market needs. They lag behind, they generally only get updated right after our municipal development plan does, which is every five to 10 years. We were very reactive in the county and numerous changes were made quickly and in response to single issues. As a result, the land use bylaw was getting to a point of being nearly unusable. 
due to the contrary, inconsistent, and confusing regulations, and it was creating a significant hurdle for moving ideas forward to successful development. So keeping the land use bylaw current and relevant is the first tool to help clear these development hurdles. So to address this, we've operationalized our land use bylaws ongoing management and update. Every two years, we assess the key priority areas that need updating or review. Each year, we also do what we call a refresh to assess and update any minor housekeeping, correct minor errors, or process changes. This approach is helping us to be more responsive to market changes and in turn helps us to manage those regulatory hurdles by reducing the need for too many land use bylaw amendments to try to be proactive about what we see coming. And so, when you have to make, a, again, a change to the land use bylaw, it really takes a lot longer in terms of the process. It can be very time consuming. The second tool we're using involves being more proactive with these regulatory changes in response to developments that do come up. And we want to consider the value of these new developments and capitalize on that within the broader context of economic diversification. We've had a few catalyst developments that have allowed us to do this. One example is the Pinnacle Renewable Energy Plant that produces wood pallets that are shipped around the world and used as an energy source. This development would bring significant value to our western area. It's out in the little hamlet of Enthistle. And by locating there, I believe it increased employment there by 10%, the small hamlet of about 400. So this was a great example of the types of the development that we wanted to encourage to support agriculture and the energy sector of West, uh, especially because we've had a significant impact because of the uh, phase out of coal. Within the county, we have uh, major coal deposits and there's been a huge mining operation by Transalpha. We also have a number of significant power plants that power much of Alberta. And so those are being phased out, uh, greatly impacting the community in the area. So when Pinnacle came along, we looked at it, and rather than just kind of changing the regulations to accommodate it, we actually created a whole new district in our land use bylaw, the Agriculture Industry District, that would allow not only for Pinnacle, but it would allow for similar businesses that were related to energy developments and value-added agriculture, and allowing them to locate close to their raw materials. A similar situation happened at the opposite end of the county in our Atchison Industrial Park. Champion Pet Foods came along. Their proposal included a large campus-style development over time, and our land use bylaw was fairly restrictive in what they could or could not do. And it was aimed more at kind of singular uses on a single lot. So again, we worked with our economic diversification staff, and we realized the opportunities for this type of development and created a new regional industrial district that allowed for campus-style phase development that grew at a very large scale. Now, while these two districts focused on very large scale of businesses, we also have a whole lot of home-based businesses and lots of entrepreneurs out there. Nearly half of our farmers have other jobs or businesses. What we were finding is that small businesses and agricultural producers wanted to diversify to ensure success, but our land use bylaw either prevented it or required a wide variety of different companies. Definitely true. So Spruce Park Branch was the catalyst for this change where they wanted to add a coffee and decor shop to their working farm and create more of a tourism destination. So we created new regulations that would allow for these types of cottage industries and have actually seen an uptake and then up about four in the last year that have come forward, allowing them to diversify and maintain their businesses. So these changes have provided valuable tools to help business recruitment, and it's generating greater interest from a variety of companies and small entrepreneurs. Give me the five. One more hurdle. And this is the last and most challenging hurdle that we've had to work on, and that's our level of service. This is the least tangible to outline and describe, but it had the greatest positive impact. In the past, we stood at the finish line. We told the client, the customer, those are all the hurdles you need to go through. Once you've gotten through them, then we'll talk to you. This resulted in a lot of frustration, a lot of, and loss of growth and development, and it wasn't much for our reputation. Over the past couple of years, we've been working with our peers and other departments to reimagine how we operate with the goal of being 
best in class in terms of how we serve our clients. How do we create a welcoming municipality where people want to bring their ideas because they know their likelihood of success is great? How do we help people and businesses succeed and enhance the county's economic prosperity together? Now, we strive to meet the customer at the starting line and go through them and go through the hurdles with them. We put the customer first, trying to truly understand their goals, their ideas, and what success looks like for them. Where are their points of highest risk? What is required from the county's regulatory side, and how do we align these requirements? This has involved communication with our customers through surveys and small discussion forums. We're shifting away from a checklist approach to meeting process requirements and moving towards a solution-oriented approach focused on the customer's ideas, needs, and goals. We focus on more responsive, face-to-face -face work with customers. It's time-consuming, but it's proving very effective. For instance, with priority projects, we set up weekly or bi-weekly meetings with clients. It's up for them to set the agenda. If they need to work on a road alignment, we get the engineers in the home with them. If they need to work on something environmental or on the wetlands, we get those people in the home with them. And we work through those problems and get them going, moving forward. While it's important to understand our customers, it's just as important to understand the other departments of the county and work together. So together, the directors of our economic diversification, planning, finance, and engineering are striving to change mindsets and approaches through education and frequent frank communication with our staff. How can we make this development happen? We encourage our staff to develop close working relationships with the clients and with their peers and other departments, challenging them about what it means to be responsive and solutions oriented. A fund has been set up that allows us to provide necessary support through studies or staffing to support economic diversification. For example, a recent study on transportation from our Atchison industrial area dispelled a common myth that this was a significant challenge for businesses to locate. We identify priority developments that become priorities throughout our, our departments because we recognize the importance of this development to the county's economic success. These projects take precedent and our economic diversification folks take a coordinating role. These have worked out well, the ones we have worked on. There's been bumps along the way, absolutely. Um, but each one, we're holding lessons learned and trying to get better each time we do that. So it is not just planning and development staff that are working with customers to face an overcoming turtle. It's a collaborative effort by many different groups in the county. We are all clear on the outcome we are aiming for. The process may not be cut and dried, but together we're facing each hurdle with our customers. So to summarize, our goal at Parkland County is to help our customers overcome planning and development hurdles by making our plans more appropriate and accessible, by proactively anticipating opportunities through our regulations, and creating a service-based collaborative mentality towards solutions. In turn, we all win when ideas become successful business developments and we share in the resulting economy. Thank you very much. Our final presenter is Kristen Catherwood from Heritage Saskatchewan. And are you from Saskatoon or, or elsewhere? No, well, I'm from Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. Uh, now we're south of China. So there were once two farmers, and they had land that bordered each other, as these farmers often do. And right where the land border, there was this sort of strip that was contested. This farmer said, it belongs to me. That farmer said, no, it belongs to me. So one year that farmer built a fence, a wall, so that that contested land was included in his field. Over the winter, this farmer dismantled it and rebuilt it so that the contested land was on his field. And so this went back and forth for years, for generations, in fact. And this was getting so contested and contentious that it was coming to violence and people were taking sides. Families hated each other. So they called in a local magistrate to come and sort out this matter. And he went and uh, dug through all the old records and documents looking for the proof of who actually owned that contested strip of land. Um, but 
try as you might, no matter how much you pulled over, you couldn't find it. It just didn't say in the records. And so these two farmers went back to their fighting until it got so bad that finally someone had the idea, let's call in the wise woman of the community, the elder, the, the midwife, the some called her even a witch or a sorceress, but she was a wise woman, an elder. And so they called her in and she came hobbling in and people gathered from all around to witness this, to find out once and for all who this land actually belonged to. And people were actually even changing, money was changing hands and making bets. Some thought, no, it definitely belongs to this farmer. And others said, no, it definitely belongs to that farmer. In fact, it does. So this wise woman comes out and she hobbles out a little and she makes her way up and down this strip of contested land. And finally, with great effort, she puts her ear down to it and she listens to it for some time. And finally, when she pulled herself back up to her feet and addressed the crowd, which grew hushed and silent and expectant, just like you. And she said to them, I've listened to the land and this is what it has told me. This land does not belong to this farmer and nor does it belong to that farmer and nor does it belong to anyone else here, but rather we all belong to it. And that's a story I learned from my friend and mentor, Dale Jarvis, um, in Newfoundland. He's a fellow folklorist, and he also works in the realms of intangible cultural heritage, which is what I do. So we're switching tacks a little bit from the previous two <laughs> presentations. But it's all related because it all comes down to how do we keep people living in place? And place is the foundation of all the work that I do at Heritage Saskatchewan. Um, I am the director of Living Heritage. Uh, for this organization, a nonprofit based out of Regina, but I do live and work in rural Saskatchewan, which is where I'm from. Um, and though our work uh, encompasses all people of Saskatchewan, including urban areas, I do tend to focus my work in rural and remote communities, um, not only because I'm a rural person myself and that's where I'm naturally drawn, but because they need more help than urban communities generally. So that's where I like to spend as much of my time as I can. So that little story I told you, which is a folk tale. Um, I'm going to tell you another quick one, which comes from a local uh, farmer, actually from Hornack, Don Kirby, who's a hail adjuster. So he spent a lot of time driving around Saskatchewan and got to know lots of rural folks. And he told me this story once. There were once two farmers and they had fields that joined each other's. And there was this large, you know, one of those huge rocks that the glaciers left behind. And it kind of was like right on the border of these two fields. And so one year, one of the farmers moved that rock. He brought in his front end, front end motor tractor and moved it into the other farmer's field so that you know he could have that area free to do his farming. And then the other farmer brought his front end motor tractor, loaded up that rock, and dumped it on the other field. So this went back and forth for some time until finally one of the farmers retired and sold his farm. And the new farmer who bought it, he brought the front of motor tractor and he picked up the rock and he just took it away to a rock pile some distance away. And the next time he showed up to his field and he approached the field, the other old farmer was waiting there for him, you know, standing against his truck with his arms crossed. And the new farmer said, hey, you know, how's it going this morning? And the other farmer said, what'd you do with my rock? So I really like that story. And that's a true story. That comes from Don Kirby. He's from Cornac. And he was part of the Cole and Corn Ackerman Heritage Project. Um, in fact, he told me that story when I was staying because as well as being a farmer, he owns a bed and breakfast with his wife, which was a very needed service in the area of Corn because Corn has a coal mine and a power plant. And so often there's a lot of um, need for information, which the town can't um, provide. And so there are lots of people who rent out their rooms in their homes. And Don Kirby and his wife are one of them. And when I was doing this Living Heritage Project, I actually stayed in their place. And so I got to really know them very well. And so he told me that story one morning, which I really love. And it, it really brings me to uh, a point I want to make throughout this presentation, which is that in my work, and the work we're all doing, no matter how far we move, we are from actual people. For dealing with people, you have people, you have conflict, and you have many different perspectives and varying ideas of how things should be or how they used to be and how we want them to be going forward. Now, as a heritage organization, um, I want to just quickly give you an idea that we're not a traditional heritage organization. We don't give out grants to maintain buildings. Um, our work is based in premise of living heritage and intangible cultural heritage. 
The tangible cultural heritage is a UNESCO dimension, convention, uh, definition, which comes from the Convention on the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage. And living heritage is a broader definition still. Living heritage moves away from a focus on the preservation of the past to a focus on how the past is used in contemporary context. And implied within that statement is how we use this knowledge going forward. So living heritage underpins the foundations of all of our communities, whether they be rural or urban, families, individuals, our identities are based in the heritage of the places from which we come. And that very much has important implications for the decisions that are made going forward. So in terms of doing a living heritage project, um, my background, which is in folklore and ethnography, is to hear from the people themselves. And as an organization, we are an advocacy organization. The word advocacy meaning to give voice to. And so really, we give voice to living heritage in this province. And by doing that, what I try to do is to actually hear from the people of these communities themselves. I want to hear what they have to say. So our work isn't um, data-driven, but we would love it to be in the future. We don't have the resources for that right now. So what we're doing and what we're doing in my work is going out into communities and um, helping them figure out what their story is, how they got to where they are now, and where they want to go next. And the very first project we did of this kind was in Cormac, where Heidi is now living. Um, coincidentally, but not because we're kind of like the here. But um, it's cool that we ended up in the same um, panel. Um, so Cormac, uh, as I just mentioned, is a coal town. Um, and it has a power plant and a monster mine. It provides about 300 permanent full-time jobs, and then there's lots of contractor positions that come up throughout the year when there's um, maintenance that needs to be done in either one of those places, and then you'll have hundreds more people coming into the community temporarily. Um, like Heidi said, it's about 600 people now. Um, it's located in the far south of Saskatchewan. It's only about 10 kilometers north of the border with Montana. It's a traditionally, it was a farming and ranching area. Um, and the thing about coal and Cornac is that, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to say too much about it because I'm going to show you at the end of my presentation a video where people in Cornac tell you for themselves what Cornac's about. Um, but basically the reason I decided to do a project there was because there is coal um, industry in Saskatchewan dating back a long time, especially from the southern bound of the province. There's a lot of like night coal there. Um, and in the early days of homesteading, in the treeless plains, that coal provided homesteaders with the heat and fuel they needed to survive. So coal has been really important in Saskatchewan ever since homesteaders started to live in the southern part of the province. Later on, that coal was taken and it was used um, to generate electricity like what is happening in Coronac now. But of course, as we know, coal is on its way out. Um, and a, pl a place like Coronac, um, and I'm from kind of near enough to know how much of an impact that mining power plant has on the surrounding area. But I also realized that for all of that, I don't actually know that much about how it came to be. And I thought about young people and how I know myself growing up in a small community, you take the things around you for granted and sometimes you take their loss for granted too. You just, it's just what happens. It's just your, the world you live in. Um, and I thought about kids who grew up in Cornac, who was a thriving community. There's like three restaurants, um, you know, there's some stores, there's sports teams, there's a curling rink, there's a hockey rink, there is a health center, there have been services over the years. Um, but when that coal plant shuts down, it's going to be really hard to maintain any of that. And I think about young people growing up who are trying to decide what to do with their lives and wanting to stay home or come back home. And how do you do that um, when A, you either do know that it's going to shut down and that job is available, or B, you actually don't understand um, how these larger economic forces shape your community. And so really this uh, project was an attempt to just hear what people in Cork have to say when there's still some time to think about an alternative vision for the future. The coal plant in Cornac is scheduled to shut down in 2029. Um, so you have about 10 years to think about an alternative future. And often when these kinds of industries go, you hear about it six months beforehand on the evening news and people are crying because they can't sell their house and they don't know what they're gonna do. Um, but of course, people in Cornac, they know that this is coming, but no one really wants to talk about it because it's a difficult reality to face. 
where I felt like I wanted, this was an experiment for us, this project, to try and approach these very difficult contemporary and future issues through a lens of heritage, approaching them softly through the back door of heritage. Let's talk about how did coal and corn I come to be? Let's talk about it. This was inspired by Harold Silco, the last living underground coal miner in Cornac. Let's tell us about the underground coal mines, tell us about how the power plant was established, how farmers were displaced in the 70s, how farmers grew together to advocate for land reclamation, which it was uh, in, at the time in the 1970s, that was a new thing. It happened first in Cornac, and it's now become mandatory across Canada for strip mining operations to reclaim the land. And that was because of a group of farmers in Cornac um, joining together in the 1970s. Let's talk about all those stories and then let's come up right to the present day, which at the time was 2017, and ask, okay, this is how we got to be here. What's next? What do we do now? So I just want to present a couple of my key lessons and also the outcomes of, what, of this project. So the project was about five months. Um, I coordinated and facilitated it. Um, the results were a, a booklet, which was written by local community members, which looks at those questions and those issues I just spoke about, the very early beginnings of coal and corn act up to the present day and asking questions in the future. We heard from el elderly people in the community. We heard from the town of corn act, the rural municipality of Hartfield. Um, and we also heard from high school students because I worked with the grade 11 class and they went out to the community and did um, interviews with local community members and they wrote essays, which are included as well. We obtained sponsorship from Westmoreland Coal, Sass Power, from the rural municipality and town to pay for the project. Uh, and also I produced a documentary um, which interviews people from a wide range of backgrounds in Cornac. The thing about it in doing a heritage project to say let's talk about the heritage of Cornac. That's a pretty large uh, topic. It's a little bit unwieldy. Let's talk about coal in Cornac and suddenly have a focus to begin and also one that stretches into the past and on into the future um, and people from many different generations and backgrounds can talk about this it's something that they all have in common and that's again that this beginning of place this is one of the key lessons i mentioned here is starting from place what is this place about why does it exist as it does how do we get to where it is and what are its most pressing issues process is probably the most important component of the project most beneficial to the community. The outcome of the booklet and the documentary are wonderful because now the community has this, this information together in one place and they can share. But the process of getting to that point was what was really important. That's what fostered connections and, and initiated conversations that maybe weren't already being had um, in the community about this is what makes us who we are and what are we going to do next. And as I already mentioned, approaching potential or real future issues through a heritage lens. In Cornac, the question is what will happen here when coal is no longer in the industry? Okay, so we're going to watch a five minute video and then I'm going to maybe take two minutes into my question time to just wrap up. Because of coal, then no matter what we look at it, coal has supported the community in, in one way or another since the Longstead days, except for a little gap in, in between the 50s and the 70s. Coal has been a necessity. There's no trees in this area when the homesteaders came in. But there was coal. It seems like under nearly every hill, all you had to do was dig in and ways in. I don't know if anybody else is still living that uh, worked in the underground mines around here and there was a number of mines, but as far as I know, they're all passed on. You know, something coming, there was a lot of seismic activity, so it's going to be either way or something. And we got some going up to. Be here. I think everybody realized that if there's a 
large strip mining project is going to displace a lot of farmers. This plant and the mine have kept a lot of people in this area. I'm still in Cornac because of the uh, If I wasn't tied down with the power ranch, if that's so passionate as I can get, I would probably be in Cornac. Our kids were able to go to school here. I doubt that this is the happen. I don't know if it is. If I'm going to smoke for Cornac, or maybe even a lot of smoke. Is this project coming in here have made a big difference in whether this place remains or disappeared? Interested, there's a longer version of that documentary on our YouTube channel that goes more deeply into some of these issues. Um, and also, the book that I mentioned is also available on our website where you can hear what people in Cordac have to say for themselves about this industry and their community. So, following from the success of that project, we move forward with our next living heritage project, which is another rural one. This was in Val Marie, another very small community in southern Saskatchewan. This one was based on the grain elevator. And this came out of, um, in 2015, the National Trust for Canada listed wooden grain elevators as most one of Canada's most endangered places. Um, the National Trust is interested in these buildings primarily for their architectural value, but I, as a farm girl, knew that they had been a lot more than that. So we went into the Marine where they have restored and uh, a 1927 wooden grain elevator. But I know the building itself is simply a symbol for a much deeper story about family farming and agriculture in that community. And so we just finished this on September 15th. As you see there was the date of the launch. Um, we had another documentary project at this time where uh, high school students did it. I would highly recommend you check that out on our YouTube channel where the students um, interview members about what the elevator means, but then we also hear from the students and what they learned about their place in the community and their hopes for the community going forward based on doing this heritage project. We also again had another booklet which was written by um, community members. Going forward at Heritage Saskatchewan, the current living heritage project we're working on is the Road Allowance Heritage of Métis People in Capel Valley. And um, I just arrived in Saskatoon yesterday from Cumberland House, which was a very harrowing drive after they had a big snowfall on Monday. Um, and we're hoping to work with them in the future too. And, and their main um, 
their, their place based in the Saskatchewan River Delta and their hopes for the future. And if I can just leave my presentation off with um, my greatest lesson, which is listening to the community and understanding that the answers should come from the community. Um, what do they have to say about how these large projects, grain elevators and, and coal projects in the Saskatchewan River Delta, starting from the fur trade era and up to the present day where the hydroelectric dam, the E.B. Campbell Dam has impacted their natural environments in the river and has changed how they make their life. Um, how do people navigate these larger external forces in their communities and how do we go forward um, with the community first and their voices first and listening to what they have to say. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to all three of you and thank you for tying that so well together.